I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney, and I want to welcome you to Black Queer Abstract, a convening on the occasion of Julie Meritu. Uh, and um, first and foremost, um, thank you um, to Julie, who inspired this event, um, whose exhibition is on view to you all today, so feel free to go up into the galleries. Um, congratulations, Julie. Um, not just on the exhibition, but on using the exhibition as a jump off point for so much more um, that we've created that we've created with you today. So thank you for that. Um, today's program is actually our first in-person uh, public program um, since March of 2020. Um, I didn't think we'd be here again with masks again today, but we are at least here. It's been a difficult year for artists, um, museums, and above all for our communities. And I just want to thank all of you um, who are here physically with us and virtually with us for your great support of the art and artists at this critical time, because it's in the arts, I believe, that we will be able to hopefully regenerate things in ways and new and fresh ways. Um, I also want to acknowledge today that we are gathered on the homelands of the Lenape people. This is actually one of the original trading sites of the Lenape Nation. The Whitney is located in a place that is important to many indigenous nations, and I hope you will join me in honoring them as we begin today's events. In 2004, <laughs> In 2004, the Whitney Biennial, um, visitors to the Whitney Biennial were riveted by Julie Meritu's painting, Empirical Construction, Istanbul. I remember it well. It's a mesmerizing work of swirling images, free-floating forms embedded in and emerging from networks of radiating and sinuous lines. Nearly 20 years later, Julie's singular vision and technical virtuosity remain as forceful as ever. And I think in this exhibition, you see how truly courageous she is as she's moved from her earliest beginnings to the work that she did most recently, which was um, still wet when it came into our galleries. Her art demonstrates that social and political commitment isn't divorced from the radical potential of abstraction. And indeed, it is the radical combination of abstract form, thought, and social practice that is the foundation of today's program. On the occasion of her mid-career survey, curated brilliantly by Christine Y. Kim, who is here from LACMA. Congratulations, Christine. Thank you so much for being here with Lulu as well. Thank you, Lulu. And um, Rue Hockley of the Whitney Museum. Julie had a vision in the spirit of her multidisciplinary practice of assembling artists, poets, scientists, and historians whose work connects, intersects, and informs her thinking to explore three key terms, black, queer, abstract. Today, we will experience an astonishing range of visions, propositions, and ideas. In planning this convening, Julie did not only imagine those of us on stage, she has been resolutely committed to the power of bringing people together across space and time, by being here today, we are all part of an extensive, indeed worldwide conversation and collective project of reimagining, rethinking, and rebuilding. And we will have people coming to us um, virtually from as far as Berlin and Greece today. So speaking of reimagining, I wanted to thank Darren Walker, who is not here at least physically present at the moment, but he will be here, I know, later today. Um, Darren of the Ford Foundation, whose generous support has made today possible. And it is really Darren's vision, courage, and humanity. And they're truly an inspiration to all of us. And we wouldn't be doing this today if it were not without Darren. Thank you to all of today's speakers. Uh -huh. Whitney is honored to have you present, hear your voices, your questions, your criticisms, your commentary, and your hopes. I'd also like to acknowledge the Whitney Public Programs team, Megan Hoyer and Andy Hawks, um, stationed behind there, um, who collaborated with Julie. And I'd also like to acknowledge our Deputy Director and Chief Curator, Scott Rothkoff, who championed the, this idea from this program at the very onset. So thank you, Scott. It is now my distinct honor to introduce acclaimed poet, coming to us live from New Mexico, um, Natalie Diaz, who will offer a reading to open the day. 
Diaz has authored numerous poetry collections, including Postcolonial Love Poem, which was the winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. She's a finalist for the National Book Award and the Forward Prize in Poetry. For, and her book, When My Brother Was an Aztec, was winner of the American Book Award. She is a 2018 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a Lannan Literary Fellow, and Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. And she was awarded a Breadloaf Fellowship in the Holmes National Poetry Prize as well as being awarded a U.S. Artist Ford Fellowship. I want to thank all of you for being here today to celebrate both the closing of an exhibition and the opening of a forum. So thank you. Iwan Jahotan, Evak Edum, Hakolo Imanj, Amich Tanam. Uh, me estoy alegre aquí con todos ustedes, um, con Julie también. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, a couple poems and um, alongside uh, Adam's land acknowledgement, this poem uh, acts as a type of land acknowledgement. Manhattan is a Lenape word. It is July and we must be brave. The ambulance's rose of light blooming against the window, its single siren cry, help me. A silk red shadow unbolting like water through the orchard of her thigh, her come in the green night, a lion. I sleep her bees with my mouth of smoke, dip honey with my hands stung sweet on the darksome hive. Out of the eater, I eat meaning she is mine, colony. The things I know aren't easy. I'm the only Native American on the eighth floor of this hotel or any, looking out any window of a turn of the century building in Manhattan. Manhattan is a Lenape word. Even a watch must be wound. How can a century or a heart turn if nobody asks, where have all the natives gone? If you are where you are, then where are those who are not here? Not here. Which is why in this city I have many lovers. All my loves are reparations loves. What is loneliness if not unimaginable light and measured in lumens? An electric bill which must be paid, a taxi cab floating across three lanes with its lamp lit gold in wanting. At 2 a.m., everyone in New York City is empty and asking for someone. Again, the siren's same wide note, help me, meaning I have a gift and it is my body made two handed of God and bronze. She says, you make me feel like lightning. I say, I don't ever want to make you feel that white. It's too late. I can't stop seeing her bones. I'm counting the carpals, metacarpals of her hand inside me. One bone, the lunate bone, is named for its crescent outline. Lunatus, Luna, some night she rises like that in me, like trouble a slow, luminous flux. The street lamp beckons the lonely coyote wandering West 29th Street by offering its long wrist of light. The coyote answers by lifting its head and crying stars. Somewhere far from New York City, an American drone finds then loves a body. The radiant nectar it seeks through great darkness makes a candle hour of it and burns gently along it like American touch, an unbearable heat. The siren song returns in me. I sing it across her throat. Am I what I love? Is this the glittering world I've been begging for? It's, uh, it's, it's really lucky also uh, to be alongside uh, this kind of resounding of, of black queer um, abstract, abstraction, abstract, like th all of these kind of uh, resoundings that have been so important to uh, indigenous art and indigenous thinking, a way of being in, in relation and alongside. This 
poem is called Like Church. My lover comes to me like darkfall, long and through my open window, mullion, transom. A good window lets the outside participate. I keep time on the hematite clocks of her shoulders, and I've done so much of it. Time. Her right hip bone is a searchlight, sweeping me, finds me. I've only ever escaped through her body. What if we stopped saying whiteness so it meant anything? For example, if you mean milk of magnesia, say milk of magnesia, or snow, or they've hurt another one of us, or the quarter moon is a smoke atop the dirty water, or the purling damp she laces up my throat, my face, mi caracol. They think brown people fuck better when we are sad, like horses or coyotes all hoof or howl, all mouth clamped down and the hair on the neck slick with leatherin. You ask, who is they? Even though you know you want me to name names, shoot, we're named after them. You think my creator had ever heard of the word Natalie? Ha. When he first made me, he called me snake. Then promised the afterlife would be reversed. South, turn north, full with tight, bright melons. Pluck one melon and another melon grows in its place. But it's hard, isn't it, not to perform with A fable, ask the turtle, ask the hare, remind yourself and your friends. Sometimes I feel fast, sometimes I am so slow, sometimes I get put down in the street. Forever I win the wound they hang around my neck. Remind yourself, your friends, they are only light because we are dark. If we didn't exist, it wouldn't be long before they had to invent us, like the light switch. Yes, our creator says kingdom and we come. Remind our friends we fuck like we church best and full of God and joy and sins and sweet upside down cake. And when they ask me what's in your love's eyes, I tell them wild sugar melons green on green on green. She and I, we eat the melons starting at their thick syruped hearts, hold the beady seeds in our mouths like new eyes, wait for them to leap open and see us first. And I'll end with, with this poem, uh, something I think that feels really lucky to imagine in the periphery of and to be in the periphery of thinking toward uh, Julie's work is, is you know, uh, the reconfiguration and the reorganization of energy uh, toward desire, um, you know, where does that, where does the imagination of love or desire exist? And, and what does it mean to make a mark with those energies? From the desire field, I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead, like you lost your rosin moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from, despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire then. Let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, verde que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot, and if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire field, bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way, surprising and many petaled the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow. 
I am struck in the witched hours of want. I want her green life, her inside me in a green hour. I can't stop green vein in her throat, green wing in my mouth, green thorn in my eye. I want her like a river goes bending, green, moving, green, moving. Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem, is it okay to be clear to say, I don't feel good? To ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted and tell it again or again until I can smell its sweet smoke, leave this thrashed field and be smooth. And I, I want to end on... A question that has been, you know, I'm a poet, so of course I'm always thinking about language, but the question that I've carried with me that I ask myself every day uh, that my partner and I ask is, you know, what is the language we need to live right now? What is the language I need to live right now? And so I'm going to just end on this quote as kind of an offering, uh, you know, to carry it alongside you all uh, through the day. So this is a quote, a line from Soretta Shredder Morgan's poem. I want to wake every morning into love, where love is the question of how I'm going to help you get free. Gracias for letting me uh, be in periphery with you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Natalie. If you're tuning in from Zoom, by Zoom, Natalie, that was incredible. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to see real people um, in real time and space. So thank you for coming and being safe and joining us for this really special day. Um, I'm the co-curator of this exhibition with Christine Y. Kim, as mentioned, who I'm so happy to see all the way from LA. Um, and I'm going to be chatting a little bit about the next program very briefly and introducing our speakers, um, and we will proceed. Um, so our first um, group conversation of the day is called Abstraction and Black Modernism. Um, and the way that this program came about the whole day is really through the back and forth between myself, Christine, and Julie. This actually was supposed to happen in LA over a year ago, or about a year ago, um, where this show originated. And so we are, we've had a lot of time to come to this really incredible program and a lot of iterations of it. So this idea of abstraction and black modernism really is so deeply at the heart of Julie's practice. Um, there, I was reading some interviews last night to prepare and a quote she gave in an interview last year, she said, one should never feel the need to translate or explain who and how one is for anyone else. Radical liberatory practices come from breaking away from the constraints of those ideas of authenticity, language, identity, culture, or any form of determinism. So much of the black radical tradition has been based in abstraction precisely for this reason. Um, and I think that sentiment is really part of what has animated our approach in this exhibition, um, in the catalog, in this program, and all the work that we've done together. Um, and really thinking about what is the space and potential of liberation um, for all people, but especially for black people, for queer people, for otherwise so-called marginalized people. Um, so this panel we brought together, these are all incredible people who've been thinking about these ideas long before this exhibition and long after this exhibition, um, people who have kind of different touching points down in these ideas of abstraction within the art context, a kind of art historical sense, but also within kind of their lived experience, their lives, the way they move through the world and the work that they do and that their work does in our institutions and in our world. Um, so in order of their appearance, we will be hearing from Stephen Nelson here in the front. Stephen is the Dean of the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts. Um, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., which is a newly appointed, relatively new job. So congratulations, Stephen. Um, and he, <laughs> yeah. um, he has recently completed two new manuscripts, Structural Adjustment, Mapping Geography and the Visual Cultures of Blackness, and On the Underground Railroad. And he is a professor emeritus at, the, at UCLA, where he served as director of the African Studies Center. He publishes widely on the arts, architecture, and urbanism of Africa, its diasporas, and on queer studies. Following Stephen, we'll be hearing from Julie, who needs no introduction. You're here, so you know. She's great. Um, 
then we will be hearing from the incredibly esteemed Martin Purrier, who we are so, so, so lucky to have here. I can't stress enough. Thank you, Martin. Um, an incredible artist who has had major exhibitions all over the world, um, the Art Institute of Chicago, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the list goes on, the Museum of Modern Art. He's in the Whitney's collection. He's been in the Whitney Biennial, the Sao Paulo Biennial, Documenta. He's won NEA grants, Guggenheim fellowships, MacArthur fellowships. I mean, he's done it a lot. Um, and he's represented the United States at the 2019 Venice Biennial, um, which was incredible and really special exhibition that we were happy, all of us, to see. So thank you for being here, Martin. Um, and then finally, our own Adrian Edwards. Adrienne is the Engelspire Family Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs here at the Whitney, where she's been since 2018. She's the co-curator of the next Whitney Biennial with David Breslin. David is also here. Hi, David. Um, and she, previously, she worked at Performa as a curator, a curator at large for the Walker Art Center. She has worked on projects with Jason Moran here at the Whitney, his first museum show um, currently as we speak. Dave McKenzie's incredible show, also his first major museum show, um, and has been a very longtime friend, interlocutor, all the things to Julie, to Christine, to myself. And I think it's this program also would not have happened without Adrian, whether that be the moral support, the intellectual support, um, <laughs> the checking us all when we needed it to be checked. So thank you, Adrian. So I'm going to invite Julie to the stage. She wants to give a few remarks and thanks. And then the rest of the four of you could all come and be seated. Thank you. It's such an honor that all of you came and are showed up this morning. Um, and especially all of the participants who came from the city, but also from elsewhere, from California and Berlin and other locations. And I'm very grateful to be in conversation here with all of you. And it's an incredible honor. Um, most of the people who are participating today are writers, artists, um, thinkers, historians, that I, uh, scientists that I'm in conversation with and been thinking about their work, and their work is really important and meaningful to me. And so I was hoping in the in the conceiving of this idea, when when Christine and I and Rue first started talking about these ideas, that um, we could use the exhibition as a platform to kind of rethink, kind of and re kind of go back towards that black radical tradition of, of kind of um, inventive liberatory thought from, 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 the, from inside the kind of places of possibility that had yet, that, have, that seemed like closed circuits. And I think that um, this was really before the um, last summer and the, the kind of crisis or emergency that was um, brought, to, brought to all of us over the past year. Past I think that there's been some incredible work that's come out of this past year, and, and we're in the middle of, of this kind of reconstruction, and hopefully it won't just be completely co-opted, but um, there are really some important kind of markers up there. Tracy's uh, been involved in a recent book um, with John Freeman called There's a Revolution Outside My Love, Letters from a Crisis, and there's a lot of other work that's being, that's being kind of is is contributing to this shift in in thinking at this moment, but it's not necessarily a shift. It's this historic way of thinking that has that has been a but that that we are involved in this continuum and um, and I think that having this show here at the Whitney uh, as a Black queer abstract artist um, is a, is an immense honor and and at and at LACMA. And, and at all the museums that it's at. But what I wanted to acknowledge is the long history of this work and that this is work that has been happening and that I have con am, am, am continuing to work with, but has been happening for decades and decades before me, for centuries. And so that's really just, I wanted to thank all of you for being here to participate in this larger um, kind of mess we're making, but reconstruction that we are trying to participate in while we, while we break some things apart. Um, I really also just want to thank a few people, um, Adam Weinberg, definitely, for the immense support of the exhibition and, um, and, and all the various crazy ideas that we had to put forth um, from, from 
days of free admission to having uh, to supporting programs like this and really trying to help us have them in person. Megan Hoyer, um, thank you for all the support and putting together the entire program with Rue and I and Christine and, and get, making sure that coordinating everything and making sure everyone could be here as well as Andy Hawks, um, thank you. And the entire AV team, thank you for everything today. And then um, Rue and Christine and Adrian, I totally, um, one can spend an entire lifetime making work and not have anyone take it very seriously. And it is an incredible, immense honor to have the kind of immense, the kind of intense scholarship and dedication and seriousness with which you took my work and practice. And I'm very humbled by that and humbled by the amount of um, consideration and just depth that you gave to, to, to the work. And um, it's a, you know, it's, it's really um, moving and just an immense honor. So thank you. And then I would like to, um, there's some close friends that traveled from far to be here and I wanted to thank them for being here today um, and for making the trip and to be being part of the family and you know who you are and I'm very grateful and um, so let's start. Good morning everyone. Um, before we get started, Julie, thank you for all of this for your show. It was amazing to see it in both places, to see it and, and also to see it in LACMA in the before times and to see it here today. This is the first time I've seen it here today. And, um, and I want to thank Christine and Rue for brilliantly curating this show. And, um, and I also want to thank Megan Hoyer and Andy Hawks for making all the arrangements for us to be here today. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think you know, my job here is to sort of think about the larger world of um, of Julie's work and and where it where it where it lands, and even seeing even seeing this show twice and thinking about Julie and I've been talking, and I'm kind of forgetting how many years now it's been about ten or so, <laughs> and um, and I've been thinking about Julie's work and um, and 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 how it works and what it does and. And there are cer certain terms that always come to mind for me. The one that, that we'll hear a lot, a lot. about are maps. Um, but for me, it's also architecture and, and things that Julie says herself. So she, she uses words like characters, swarms, um, spectacles. And I think about land masses and, and what happens. And so I, I think so about, about a work like Black City and, you know, it's, it's, it's in... Julie talks about world making, but I think of it as world unmaking, because what what she has done is that she takes space and she takes all of these characters and she turns them on their heads and turns them against each other. Some of them are super angry, some of them are nice, some of them are layered, and then and she gives us a place to hide. And so I find this place to hide, and then realize that the place I thought I was going to is a different place. And so, and I'm, I'm always grateful for that. And it's always different. And so seeing those things in 2019 and seeing them again in a different space, in a different context, because work in 2021 is not the same as work in 2019. 2019 projects are not 2021 projects. And I looked at one of my own manuscripts in 2021 and took it apart because it just isn't this. Um, but. I want to think about space for a couple of minutes and think about how, how we get to space and how we think about space. And so much of my own work has been about thinking about architecture, thinking about maps. And I'm not going to say a lot about maps because a lot of people have a lot of interesting things to say about maps. But I want to think about not just, you know, sort of looking at what, what artists like Julie do, but what happens when we look at them and then look back at other work. And so this came from a project I worked on a few years ago on, um, on this map and how it sort of creates France's colonial world at the turn of the 20th century in one journal. And I came upon this after looking at things like Black City. 
And so the questions changed. The questions didn't become, OK, what is the world making? The, the, the question became, what are the questions I can make out of this map that seems to be authoritative and is telling me where we are, who we are, and what our place is in the empire? And what is the need for France to have these huge maps? What is the need for a public, a, a general publication to make a map like this, which is about 100 inches by 70 inches. It's a huge, massive map. Um, and why did they keep making them and making them and making them? And so those are the kinds of things that works like Julie's have made me sort of, sort of rethink. Um, and also, you know, other kinds of engagements. I mean, I, my, I have to come out as a former map maker myself. <laughs> and you're seeing on the screen my one public commission, which was in the 80s um, in Harvard Square in Cambridge. And, and in my own work as, as an architectural historian, I, I lived in Cameroon for a year while I was working on my doctorate. And other kinds of things I do, the, the grave marker you see on the right is from a trip I took to underground railroad sites and plantations in 2009. And, and what I'm interested in with all of these things, and those questions change over time, um, is to think about architecture. You know, even a rock is architecture. Even these things is architecture. And how, you know, and its uses. And so it's not just that I want to look at how these things are built or see where they are. I want to see the kinds of worlds that people make and the kinds of worlds they unmake in the making of these worlds. And so to do that and then to come back to things like Julie's work, things like Steady One or even Mark Bradford's work, um, looking at Scorched Earth from 2006. Coming through all of these experiences, you know, thinking about abstraction, thinking about queerness in terms of both the possibility for liberation, but also being a queer person or being a black person and, and how that affects how I look. You know, we, you know, we're, you know, this is not neutral, right? Um, and so, you know, when I, you know, we, we come upon these things and what is it from our collective pasts and our personal pasts that then sort of think through how these things happen. And so in, in Julie's work, Mark's work, all of our work, what we then sort of start parsing out, because I think that you know, our endeavor in a, in a way is following artists, not to, not to figure out what they want to do. All right? If I want to know what Julie's doing, I will ask her. You know, she doesn't need me saying, Julie wants X. All right. But when Julie tells me Julie wants X, I can then look at the work and say, well, the work is doing Y. Right? Um, and that conversation change and changes and ebbs and flows over time. And even looking at, at Stadia now, compared to when I first looked at it in, say, about 2007, it's a different work for me. Formally, it's a different work. Conceptually, it feels different. Um, I to, even today, I was walking up, you know, through the through the galleries, and I was like, "Oh my God!" There's this uncanny ability you have to make canvas look like vellum, and I just never thought about it before. And I was like, "Okay," and what does that then mean in terms of the kinds of work, the kinds of sort of querying of materials, for lack of a better term, that then takes place? Um, and then I just want to look at this for a minute. Because I think that, you know, we, we often will treat abstraction as if it is a thing in and of itself. And, you know, in my experience, and I think in the experiences of the, the artists I know or work with, you know, someone like, like Maria Magdalena Campos Pons or Meshekwa Langa, who was, who was born in South Africa and now you know, works in Amsterdam, that they, you know, abstraction is something that, that we move in and out of. There's, there's a really sort of fuzzy line between the two, right? And so, so on that level, when we're looking at work like Julie's or like Mark's, we can then take that sort of what is, what is that potential in the abstract 
and look at things like these, which aren't necessarily abstract to the same degree because I see a bottle or I see a picture of a person or I see, but what is the notion? What is the upsetting? What is the unmaking that's happening? And in the case of, you know, in the case of Magda, it is a sort of looking at a personal history through the larger history of the Atlantic, of the Atlantic slave trade you know, the transatlantic slave trade and how her family wound up going from Nigeria to Cuba. Or in the case of Langa, who grew up under apartheid in South Africa, you know, he started in the late 90s, mid late 90s, making maps and he made maps and, and started doing all these crazy, crazy lists and indexes of maps. And, you know, and they skirt across his own place in the world his own making, unmaking the kinds of things that he was looking at. And so he, he talks about boundaries. And he would say that, you know, in our third grade primers, there was, there was a boundary and, you know, X people lived on one side and Y people lived on the other. But when I was on the ground, it just, it wasn't that way. Right? And so there's this, you know, the fiction of the boundary, the fiction of the empire where, you know, oh, group A lives here, group B lives here, but they do this and we don't account for this. Um, and so in all of those ways, you know, I think that, you know, what, you know, if we, we, if we come back to, if we come back to these questions of black modernism, you know, what, what does that mean? We can throw out that term. And what it means for me is A, it's a plural, because there is not just one black modernism. And I think that even if we look at Martin's work and Jubilee's work, we can see these different strands. All right, that make these overlapping worlds that do different things. But it is, I mean, it's a space of experimentation. It's a space of reimagining who and what we are in the world. And it's a, a place of unmaking the worlds that were given to us. And then inventing new ones that in turn will be reinvented the next time we look at them. And with that, I'm going to sit down. Thank you very much. I'm going to just read um, some notes on painting that I wrote. Um, they're, they're kind of put together from letters with correspondence with Robin Cost Lewis. Um, in a conversation, we, long conversation we've been having um, in the project that we're working on together. And then also um, in trying to make, trying to think of, through this and make sense of what I do, I tend to jot down different notes at different times. And so this is a, a, comp a, a compilation of those. This program, I think it's really, just, uh, it's this conversation of, uh, uh, and, and this way of kind of giving a platform to these different discourses and these different projects that are people are invested in that are um, their own work and not necessarily in relation to one another, but that there are these kind of important relationships. And so um, new notes on painting. Origins. Abstraction is a vehicle for complexity and unknowing and indeterminacy. A vehicle for speculative thought in the break or the glitch ways of drawing and making sense of self, intentionally exploring contradictions inherent to the experience of democracy, violence, racial capitalism, mumbling, murmuring, mumbling, murmurings, babbling, da da, ha ha. Abstraction is heritage on the, of the history of the visual from Pharaoh and Babylon, the caves of Dunhuang, the Nazca lines of Peru, the pyramid of the sun and the moon, out of the gaps and the breaks of the fractal logic for West African textiles and music, Ethiopian illuminated manuscripts, the Vimalakuti Sutra, music, all, different forms of jazz, music, architecture, astrology, the history of Western painting, desire, failure, retreat, reinvention, creation of something else completely from all of that. Abstraction is world making, an, inter an internal coherence the layering, collective, reiteration, mimetic negotiations in the Pan-Asian, Pan-African, the Global South, the cosmopolitan. Failures of the tropes of the modernist, pro of, failures of the trope of modernist progress and utopia and colonial thought. Entropies like pandemic. Blur, exodus, unknowing, uncertainty and precarity, 
of our moment, the political and social vertiginousness that we experience, mining the archives for speculative thought to untie limits and constraints, mining the all-world archive of Edward Glisson. Get at the strangeness of the future image and experience rather than habitually view and decipher, cognizant of the reactive anxiety of challenges to white supremacy globally. Abstraction is a strategy, a false binary of abstraction and figuration. It's bound up with the modern and colonial Eurocentric understanding of a nation state, one that destroys worlds, one that takes or finds potent forms of world making, one that captures and breaks them into categories of art, architecture, religion, science, poetry. Abstraction is a way around that, a strategy as a strategy of resistance against flattening, a refusal of description, of language, of containment, a breakdown of national identity, not being reduced to the body, the skin, a place, a language, rather a trajectory for a more complex and discursive creative project embedded in the all-world psyche. This is diaspora. It is a form of knowledge building, invention from all drawn language. Visual neologisms, a cycle of new vocabulary from past vocabulary, the pressure of our social, global, and planetary condition makes new meanings in the glitches between the marks of recall, remix, and fresh. Abstraction is the break, an alternative logic. Find the break, that gap, the fissures, undo, pull apart, the open force of unraveling possibility. An emergent logic, so that the absent image becomes a presence in its own right so that the viewer and the image are intertwined and indistinguishable. The presence of a ghost, paradigmatic. With ideology and myth structure itself, painting as performative time. How do we practice the continual release rather than venerate the incarceration of the fugitive? What if criticism which refuses the separation of what it, it's, what it is that the artist does from what it is that the viewer does is the develop, devotional profanation of the sacred. That's a quote of Fred Moten's. Abstraction is erasure. The erasure becomes a mark, sprayed colored ink, then erased. Erasure can be the most solid parts, more insistent even than the insistent marks, ghosts of the blurred image underneath. Erasure as mining, as excavation, the place of centuries past, but also emergent visual neologisms, since every mark has been made before, every gesture not new, every mark a copy, copying a theft, remix. Is erasure as the insist insistence of invention, is erasure as the insistence of invention, wrangling something else from a shared and coded language, the spirit medium of a communal? Abstraction is mining the surround, mark it, wipe it away, remark, but still an insistence on being, in existing through erasure, as in I am present, I am here, Hineni, mine for resources, for parts to a future. It is a time-based emergent experience. Abstraction is in the glitch. Lose my sense in my hands and materiality, allow me to mark and erase back to front. That's important, the inability to fully see, but to feel, to lean hard on intuition, to trust the hand, Backwards, a mining for marks and signs and thoughts floating in the medium of, billion of billions of years of mark making, push, scratch, cut, stay, premonition, draw faster, last chance with the oral clue, serve intuition, impulse, improvisation, it is symptomatic. Prove it futile, as futile as the marks themselves. The marks are comfortable with that. They create the headache. And then as I was um, thinking through, th through this, I was also thought of a, another thing I would love to share. I mean, it's again kind of abstract, but hopefully it, will, it won't be too much. But um, I think, how are we doing with time? Are we OK? OK, then um, this is a piece I wrote when I was asked to um, write uh, in an anthology coming out on John Coltrane, and this is a piece of, of, that I put together, a small piece for that, it's called, um, earlier this year, called 12 Notes on Listening. And I think it has a real relation to the kind of context of what I'm thinking about for today, but also, or the way that I was thinking about today, but also uh, 
I just thought it was, when I was rereading it um, the other day, I thought it was kind of an interesting way to, th to think through someone else's work about one's own and one's making. 12 notes on listening. One, to find the dynamic interventions, inventions in the fabric of existence and being, mythic, the desire for testament of the soul. Deep interior, morning joy, exhilaration, medium, muse, vessel, horn. One thing I should say, I wrote it in 12 parts after his structuring of um, and thinking through giant steps and that piece. So it's like the way he thought through that is how I kind of put this together. Two, multidimensional, polyphonic, the conditions of being, stretching space time, the limits of the unknown, uncharted, to reach and touch that depth. The intuitive insistence on being, reverberations in the break or as another possibility completely like abstraction, pushing the boundaries of existence, accessing larger, more complex, more consequential entities than most cultures permit one to believe. Reconstructing imaginative capabilities, augmenting, morphing to exhalation. Three, contortions or harmonious, spontaneous interrogations, flexing through the hall of mirrors of our perforated realities, fractally disseminating and reconstructing drops, light, speed, cadence, shape, reality, compressing the myriad of notes into the howl, wail, serenade, like the mark. Mumbling inside the indiscernible hole, finding the sound of Nagasaki through a flute, Mining the breaks and the shifts of the axis of the world by how the sound touches you, by how the mark touches you. Kaya Sereno says composition, music composition, is simply a different type of imagination than abstract painting. Four, in the face of impossibility, catching the detritus, the molecules, the morning and the light, elegy, pain, love, mysticism, touch, takes one, heuristic touch, a transport, coming from another place, another entity, Progress, futurity, imaginative other dimensions and possibilities of love, being, with hearts and tongues, liberation into indeterminacy. Five, representation as definitive exposes the failures. Abstraction pulls from that, mimics, it slices, melds, and spins it into the multitudes, blowing out the limitless possibilities of space, touch, emotion, and rebelliousness. A modernist, futurist, inexhaustible being offering his lungs, his sounds, his compositions, active steps within the language, the music, by himself, verging on recklessness, to break apart and out of paradigms, out of bounds, howl, celestial, and infinite. Rearrangement of molecular structure, science, music, math, universal truths, innovative mining sounds, 60 billion years, history, nature, emotions, experience, hearing it, the experiential transformation, intellectually mining the systems, the galaxy, God, the cycle of fifths, existential consciousness and transcendence. Seven, outside of the violence, hatred, racism, and social death that is prescriptive, train chases every other possible dimension, Cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, Universalism, Buddhism, Hinduism, God, notions of the beguiling, of the opiate-infused brain, experiential, again, beautiful. Eight, constantly mining, mixing, evolving, shifting, insatiable, and never satisfied, on unstable ground, ruminations, the terror, the tenor, the flight, a form of imaginative invention, refusal of fatality, with grave confidence, I don't believe in standing still, Radical humility of the knowledge that our perception of reality is fragmentary. Nine, free, going out on the edge as far as possible, liberation. Remember, breaking free from portraiture to find a form, a language. The breaking open of liberatory imagination. Innumerable possibilities at once, ultimate compression of space-time. When drawing, pull out of myself, lose place, go deep into a pressurized state of disfiguration, disembodiment, lose all sense of cultural self, get lost inside the beat, inside a sonic pulsing system of half-links, half-consciousness, half-wit, find the break. 10, working against the parameters of reality, the machinations of white supremacy, constantly defining and delineating being against the domination of language, representation against the constructs and methods of social death. In the face of trauma embodied as a response to the terror, the war, as a response to the terror, war, and the determination to extinguish the singular and collective being. Resisting, denying decimation into minute segments. 11. 
to look forward to, to look forward the bits, the measures, data, infrastructure, symbols of power, smoldering them onto a new machine, fusing the parts with marks that come and try to form something else legible, but descend into their own illegibility. Twelve. I always liken it to looking at the sun, hearing John Coltrane, is like the brightest star you can hear. Mining from that deep, deep part of himself to stretch and extend space-time into the infinite cosmic ways of being free. Can the place of intuition interiority be a place of communality? A place of the murmurings, maybe even the undercommons. Can that place be the ontological congregation of resistance? Intuition as the ontological congregation of resistance a constant persistence of the imperceptible multitudes of entities who exalt the real. Thank you. Thanks, I'm Martin Perrier. And um, I apologize for leaving the stage. Um, I'm actually much more nervous than I expected to be, and I'm having to collect myself because I didn't prepare a written text, and uh, I, I almost never do that. Um, but I am gonna try to keep this somewhat coherent. <laughs> I decided to try to talk about what in my own memory were forebears from the black community who ventured into abstraction, ways of different ways of, of depicting reality. And so I'm, I'm gonna go through, hopefully I have enough time to do this, go through uh, a number of very important people. F for me and, and uh, as an artist, uh, historical figures, um, most of them except for I think the last person I'm gonna talk about is um, they've de they've, they're deceased. And I'll make apologies for, for not including somebody like um, Norman Lewis and um, uh, Buford Delaney, who came to mind after I put my list together, and others, anybody else I forgot. But I'm going to talk about um, some early uh, black modernists, not always completely non-objective, but abstract, an abstracting tendency, which of course is something that if you study art history, you know that just like jazz coming up the river from New Orleans, the, the origins of, of, of uh, abstraction in, in France, one of the origins is located in the, in the collision of, of um, French uh, painters looking for new ways of, of, um, of, of dealing with reality and coming up against with uh, uh, art from alien peoples the art of Oceania, in particular the art of Africa, the, the, the tribal arts of Africa were extremely important in, in, in deflecting um, the painters in, in Paris uh, into a kind of cubistic way of, of seeing reality. And um, I'm going to end up with an artist who is in fact an, uh, an African artist, a Senegalese artist, who um, I think represents a very, very fascinating trajectory into abstraction. Um, sort of the reverse. So uh, I'm going to show a few slides. Um, the first is Alma Thomas, um, a painter, a uh, woman who uh, worked for 35 years as a school teacher in Washington, D.C., and at the age of 75, came out uh, exhibiting abstract works, which um, rocked the city of uh, Washington and, in some ways, the art world. Uh, her work was not absolutely new at the time, but uh, for her, it, it was, um, I think, um, a, a breakthrough. And I, and I think most of the artists that I'm going to talk about um, have what I saw reinforced as I went through Julie's show upstairs again for the second or third time, which is um, abstraction, which is dis not, not disconnected, but which is connected to social uh, issues and uh, realities, lived realities of, of a community, specific lived realities of a community, uh, as opposed to being a purely aesthetic move, which is how you could describe uh, abstraction as a solution to, a, to an aesthetic uh, cul-de-sac, which I think that's how it was. I see it as, 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 as something in, uh, which I associate with more French 
the kind of French modernist tradition. Um, the only person who I think is, is not in that vein of the people I'm going to talk about is Alma Thomas. And maybe after 35 years of teaching middle school, um, she really yearned for that uh, lux calm et volupté that Matrice talks about in his work, uh, luxury, calmness, and, 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 and uh, voluptuousness. Uh, after 35 years of being a middle school teacher in D.C., so 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 her work, her work is is um, really about the joy, the same kind of Matissean joy that that you see when you when you look at Matisse's uh, embrace of, of of color and lyricism. So this this is her her work, Elysian Fields, and then the other one is um, White Roses Sing and Sing, and she she suddenly came out with this at the age of 75 and produced a, a body of work that was uh, interesting related to the Washington Color School, people who became um, associated with that movement, um, Kenneth Nolan, Marish Lewis, uh, second generation would have been Sam Gilliam, Ken Young, uh, people like that. But she was a, a unique person in the trajectory that she, that she took to reach this way of working and exhibiting. The second artist I want to talk about is, of course, um, Jacob, well, I guess that's not, is um, w William H. Johnson, a um, modernist who came from, um, he was born in um, 1901, very humble background, Florence, North Carolina, or South Carolina. Um, followed a rather conventional trajectory of, of uh, leaving his rather humble uh, place of, of birth and condition of birth, uh, drawn by this insatiable desire to, to draw and paint, ended up studying at the Art Students League in New York. And then, um, like a number of black artists uh, at the time, whether they're in music or in writing or in, in, in the visual arts, found his way to Europe as a way to, to, to find a, a more open uh, place to realize themselves, realize their destiny, and, and, and hopefully some success and recognition. Um, he, he ended up uh, studying in Paris, became under the influence of European modernist painters. Um, Chaim Soutine, I think, was a strong influence when he was in Europe. Ended up in Scandinavia and came under the influence of um, Edvard Munch. And, um, and his work reflected those European um, influences. He came back to the States in the, um, in the 40s. And in the 40s, he did a remarkable body of work, which was really his own work. And it was uh, the most abstracted uh, style that, that he had ever practiced uh, previously. It was, uh, I think, a collision with his own history and past as an American, uh, as a black American, uh, living with the realities after having that kind of um, relative freedom in Europe. Um, he, he married, a, I think, a Norwegian or a Danish wife. And, and came back to the States. He actually um, had a very short but, 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 f but fevered and, and, and intense period of, of, of working in this um, style that he act actually thought of as, as um, he, he actually described himself as a kind of primitive. But it was a primitive, a primitivism that I think was extremely, he was very self-conscious of himself as somebody who was regarded as a primitive, as a person who was who was a, a black person living in Europe. Actually, he was black, and he, he was acknowledged to have Native American ancestry as well. But, but he, he was very conscious of having been thought of as a primitive, and he embraced that in some ways in, t in talking about his work. But he was a person who actually had been academically trained. And, and, um, and this last body of work, which was extraordinary, and it was, it was ended up um, collected by the Harmon Foundation. It's, it's, it's overwhelmingly represented in the Museum of American Art in Washington, because uh, when he came back to the States, 
he began to have some mental problems and he was committed to a mental hospital in Islip where he, he lived from the late, I think the um, late 40s uh, until his death in, I think, 1970. So, um, but he was an extraordinary modernist who I, I found was uh, very important. The next person is Jacob Lawrence who needs no introduction. Uh, he's an amazing person in the sense that he arrived full blown in his early 20s with his mature style. He didn't evolve into it. It certainly continues to evolve, but he, he, he came out in his, in his early 20s. Um, and at the age of 23, he had produced a cycle, and this was typical of his work, which was to create these sequences or cycles of historic narratives in visual form. Extraordinary, extraordinary works. Uh, stylistically mature from the very beginning. And um, uh, once I, I heard him give a lecture, um, and he was asked by someone in the audience, how do you reckon with, with so much of the tragedy and violence and, and hatred and bigotry that you, that's depicted in your work? And, and this, I thought, was so extraordinary. His answer was, when I paint, I see patterns and colors and moving shapes. And, 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 and that, was, that was, to me, that was so emblematic of, of, of a true artist who puts even the most intense, vicious social realities through a filter of pure visual um, phenomena. And this was, this was, I think, when he was quite quite advanced. Um, he must have been in his 70s when I heard this question answered. And I, I was just struck by that, that uh, the, the, the fact. That was the last one, the one of the, with the blind image. That's one of his earliest works. That was from sometime in the 30s. But you can see his work, in his work, that he just is obviously working with these elements, the visual elements of, of, um, of um, color and form and part-to-part -part composition, very dynamic, at the same time as he's engaging with historical fact, with realities, telling the story of the, the, this, this, like the, the, and when he was 23, he made this 60 panel sequence of paintings, the, the migration series. And that was this sort of standard way of working. He would seize on a period in history and, and narrate that through, his, through these amazing images. And, um, and I think, are we through with, let's see, I'm not keeping track of these images, but this is, a, this is something that was recently shown at the Met um, in his, one of his latest series uh, of, um, what was that called? Um, the American Struggle. And this was, this was not strictly related to the struggle of black Americans. This was really a more panoramic a view of, of, of history. Uh, and this was an incredible painting having to do with um, Native American uh, treaty, uh, Native American treaties issues. So at 23, he, he, he came up with this he exhibited a 60-panel work, the Migration Series. He's, he did series about Harry Tubman, John Brown, Toussaint Louverture, the uh, Haitian uh, liberation fighter and leader. Um, and I think we should move to the next, because time is short. Um, Aaron Douglas, born in 1899 in Topeka, Kansas. I happen to have met him because I taught for a couple of years at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he had done an important cycle of murals on the Fisk campus, and I think he taught at Fisk as well. But um, he was a person who um, had studied in, in Europe, studied briefly in, in Paris, I think, and uh, came, came back to the States, uh, was a graphic designer and muralist. Again, um, always dealing with images from uh, black American life. Um, he would embody the ideal of 
the African American artist that would was prescribed by Alan Locke, the black um, what you call him a philosopher, uh, aesthetician, um, who um, prolific writer about a culture and and black culture at the time, and he had he had uh, written profusely about the importance of the black artist remembering his origins in Africa and somehow trying to um, acknowledge that and include that in the imagery of, 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 of his work. And uh, I know from, from, from uh, interaction, direct interaction with um, Aaron Douglas that he was very strongly influenced by African art and, and Egyptian art as well. Egyptian art was a very strong influence on his work. But he did, he did extraordinary um, murals, uh, somewhat decorative in style, um, and um, and also graphic design, woodcuts and uh, uh, like these. Um, and uh, how are we doing with the images? This was, this was um, a collaboration, uh, pr a publication of um, Langston Hughes's uh, work um, in, in, in a collaboration with uh, Aaron Douglas's illustrations. Stark, graphic. Um, so the next person is, is um, Romare Bearden who needs no introduction, except that this is Romare Bearden's um, abstract work, which may not be as familiar as his later works in collage, which were figurative. These were actually preceded his realistic or his uh, figurative work, but less well known. Actually, there was a show of this work recently at, uh, at a gallery in, in New York. Um, I saw it the first time when I was living in Europe, and I picked up a European, I think a French art magazine called Cimes, and I was struck by an abstract painting on the cover, and I realized it was Romare Bearden. And, and, uh, and it's ironic that this work uh, was done before he went into focusing on, on his um, uh, collage work which he's much better known for, and his figurative work. OK, here's the artist I want to end up with. And this is an interesting case of a 10 minutes. OK, I'll try to get, get through this in 10 minutes. Here's a person who, whose work I had never seen until uh, I was contacted by, the, by MoMA. Um, to make to, to write a little bit of essay for a um, publication that they came out with about the um, black artists in Moma's collection, and this is a Senegalese-born artist, Senegalese actually for his entire lifetime, named Mustafa Dime, and he was a sculptor, um, interesting person who grew up in Dakar, Senegal, the capital of Senegal, uh, the son of an accountant. So, so not a particularly tribal person. Um, I think he was probably a Wolof, but, but a cosmopolitan person. Dakar is a very cosmopolitan city. I, live, I, live there in, I lived in Sierra Leone during the, in the 60s, and I was struck when I visited Dakar numerous times how, how French the, the city felt. Uh, boulevards and white uh, sort of state buildings and very, very French culture. And the women, I was struck. I remember seeing sitting in the, in the cafe, sidewalk cafes in Dakar, and watching these very tall women walking down the boulevards with their long dresses, the boo-boos, uh, flowing behind them. And this is a, a sculpture by this artist, uh, Mustafa Dime, called Woman with a Long Neck. And the Wolof people are very tall and stately, and of course, being, uh, um, in a recently 
liberated uh, colony from France. They had that incredible sense of style, very tall headdresses, and I was just, I would sit in the cafes watching this procession of, of, of gorgeous um, beauty up and down the, the roads. So when I saw this sculpture, it just really said, this is an amazing thing. This is, a, this is an African artist who's never, never been outside of Africa when he made this. He had been exposed to um, French um, art teachers. He, he, he finally, he started out actually interesting, interesting, interesting love. He was born into a family of, of um, his father was an accountant. So he was born to a family that discouraged his going into anything that, that involved handwork, working with his hands. And he was first apprenticed, I think, to a blacksmith. And he was drawn to, to, to manual labor, which his parents really, really didn't like. This is similar to how a lot of people react to having their kid say, I want to be an artist. But, but, in, th but in this case, he, he, was going in, he wanted to go into a trade, a manual trade. And he ended up going into carving. And, and he um, studied, he traveled, he went to, went to many places in Mali and Gambia and, 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 and sort of apprenticed and struggled financially to, to learn this trade. He ended up finally getting a scholarship to go to the uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Dakar and studied with French art teachers in Dakar. And um, what was interesting was he, from that experience, and, and having exposure to Western art, which by then had been influenced by African art, and he, in term, term goes and, and realizes that he wants to make an art that relates to his own experience and his own people. And he gets involved in carving an assemblage, the same kind of thing that, that Western artists would put together elements, discrete elements, disparate elements, within their collage and assemblage method. He began to do that in his own work. And one, one example of his, his uh, particularly African um, way of thinking about his work is that when he was taught to carve using a mallet and a chisel, he rejected that because that's what Europeans do. And he went and he went back to his ads, which is like a transverse ax that you hack with. And this, and you can see the evidence of that in in the, in the factory in, in his work. It's such a strong part of the way he worked. Is he, he said that had to be something African, strictly African. And his use of, of found materials, his use of rusted iron to make these uh, fringed kind of wing-like elements that he puts into the side of this. And the way that he reached his own kind of abstraction, um, which was came out of his own experience. It was not, I mean, he was exposed to European abstraction, notions of abstraction, but it was an abstraction that, that you can't see direct connections to, um, to the um, sculpture, say, the tribal sculpture of the Bamana people or the Dogon people that would be his indigenous roots. It's aesthetic. This, this is something that's much more, this came up from him. So I just think it's ironic that, that this whole abstracting tendency, which is a hallmark of modernism, and, and, and to see the, the different ways that it's been uh, adopted, um, moved into, and, 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 and uh, uh, engaged by, by um, Africans and people in the African diaspora uh, is it's such a rich tradition, and that's really what I wanted to say. So, thank you. I'm really honored to be here with um, my lodestar, Julie, as I call her, and the great Dr. Stephen, and the deeply inspiring Mr. Purrier. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Megan and Andy, also, for organizing today's symposium. And immense thanks to Christine and Rue for making history with such an important and stunningly beautiful show. Canon, ladies, canon. So I titled um, my talk today, Theaters um, of Abstractions, uh, a meditation on looking, thinking, feeling, blackness. 
And um, I didn't want to start here, but I'm going to have to in order to, to do the thing. Uh, Clement Greenberg, the patron saint <laughs> of uh, the purest school of abstraction, wrote, and this is a quote, the essence of modernism lies in the use of the characteristic methods of a discipline to criticize the discipline itself, not in order to subvert it, but to entrench it more firmly in its area of competence." End quote. A critical approach demands a denaturalization of Greenberg's parameters for modernist abstract art. Precisely by bringing to bear a historical context to and invoking historical situations in our positioning of and thereby relation to it. In such a formulation, the eternal configuration of abstract art as generic cannot hold. Here's the takeaway up front. Unlike Greenberg, I believe abstraction already indexes the social, political, and economic conditions of the society in which it is made and that those conditions are oftentimes cumulative, anachronistic, and materialized in the work itself. Aesthetics always pertain to dynamics of identity and power, typically exercised through questions of production, discourse, and authority. To be clear, who has sanctioned it? I have spent many years now circling around the multivalent fact of blacknesses seemingly unlimited usefulness in the history of modernity and its modernisms, particularly as it relates to abstraction, specifically black monochromes. This is because as a problem for thought, they literally mark an undeniable distinction, a kind of contrapuntal shift between the world works of artists such as Louise Nevelson, Robert Rauschenberg, Frank Stella, Ad Reinhardt and Mark Rothko, and the likes of Norman Lewis, that went by a little fast, huh? Sam Gilliam, Barbara Chase Rubo. Mr. Purrier. Indeed, experiments with black matter have significantly expanded incrementally over the past 30 years as a range of black works by black artists, including Senga Ngudi, David Hammonds, Ellen Gallagher, Glenn Lycan, Steve McQueen, Julie, Adam Pendleton, Kevin Beasley, Oscar Murillo, Rodney McMillan, Rashid Johnson, Aria Dean, and I could go on. Um, I've tried to grapple with not just why this color and abstract sensibility together but how have these artists approached them in their singular yet related ways? In order to get there, we need to deal with what we call haints, where I'm from, which names the non-visible present darkness of things to provide a response to what Frank Wilderson demands in imploring, quote, we need a new language of abstraction to explain this horror. A quest to forge a language of abstraction with explanatory powers emphatic enough to embrace the black, end quote. Conceptual artist Ralph Lemon, who couldn't be here today, but since his warmest wishes, shot this video in August 2002 at Hill Country Blues legend Otha Turner's last family goat barbecue picnic in Mississippi. Ralph has been experimenting in conducting field research in the Delta for around at least 20 years. I especially like his obscure private and semi-private dances in the living rooms of blues musicians' relatives, in old joke joints, in motel rooms along interstate highways, on the graves of blues singers, and in the driveway of civil rights activist Medgar Evers, where he was assassinated in 1963. Here's Ralph reflecting on dancing alone in Yazoo City on Thanksgiving Day, also in 2002. 
Mr. Minifield, who was found fishing in the swamp, was accused of attacking a woman with an ax at point 26 miles distant. There was no indication to prove that he was the criminal. When the posse discovered him, he was in the company of another man. Both were seized and charged with the crime. Mr. Minifield's companion escaped, angered because he'd slipped from their clutches. The mob prepared to burn Mr. Minifield. He was dragged to a cleared space in the swamp, and a stake was driven into the ground until only his head was visible. A match was set to the brush, and as the flames crackled around the man, the woods resounded with the shouts of the mob. Empty bleachers and a little stage inside the shell of an old building with no front facade or roof on Main Street. I danced on the stage, occasionally falling through the decaying plywood to Mississippi John Hurt's 1928 recording, Lewis Collins. I encourage you to go and listen to it. It's incredible. The song seems appropriate, somebody mourning somebody else. It's simple and hypnotic tone, a sublime activation, cars speeding by on Main Street, my audience, a three-minute blues dance twice, a prayer maybe to Mr. Menefield, and to all those who had run away, in truth or fiction. And then one more dance, but this time a freer movement experiment to the Pretender's Chain Gang, a hurling body dance just for me, bringing the episode a little more forward in time while staying backward, I hope. The sky is a radiant blue and not a single car nor person stops to watch. In low country South Carolina, it is common to paint the ceiling of your porch or the frame of your door or windows or shutters, a color called haint blue, in order to stop a ghost from riding you to death to the point of exhaustion. Strange thing, no? that kind of blue that warded off the blues which originally made from indigo, the crop, along with rice, the enslaved tended to exhaustion until cotton became king. You see how it begins to fold in on itself, the thing, one thing after the other, related and sedimented. Glenn wrote, blue is the veil through which blackness appears, the feeling for a color beyond a, co a concern for representation. I'm struck by how Ralph uses his body to generate a kind of speculative knowledge, a resonance between past and present, the language and gestures delivered simply. How could he attend to unspeakable violence with the most ordinary inflection, abstractly? He acquiesces to the very impossibility of approaching the matter. The historical and social fashioning of blackness results from the organizing systems of modernity. These include the concept of race and capitalism as well as the institutions and nation states that sustain them. Consider the historical role of black people as literal commodities subjugated into the service of imperialist and colonialist regimes. For artists who want to convey or complicate a particular kind of experiential knowledge of blackness, one that stems from this history of violence being visited upon the black body as it was subjected to a vast and abstract network of value that involved commodities, accumulation, currencies, bonds, and futures, the strategies of abstract art are highly relevant. I wanna go back to that staging ground that is cotton, which fueled this transnational complex commercial web that ultimately unfurled an exploitative conglomeration of capital and state power, a new way of organizing economic activity is the monumentally scaled plantation complex. An ingenious characteristic of this new system was the involvement of the states, which supported the enterprises of private citizens. In other words, individuals exercised a controlling influence and supreme dominance over the population backed by the forces of the state. These individuals were licensed to privatize violence, soldier traitors, armed private militias, explicitly to instigate, propagate, and maintain the reign of slavery. This dominion of war capitalism, as historian Sven Beckert aptly names it, is operated on two levels. One, one hand, the state encompassed laws, institutions, and customs with a state-enforced rule. On the other hand, simultaneously, there existed an entirely different structure. 
characterized by expropriation of vast territories, the decimation of indi indigenous people, theft of their resources, enslavement, and the domination of vast tracts of land by private individuals with effective little oversight. There, masters trump states, violence defied the law, and bold physical coercions by these individuals remade markets. Such an elastic totality is what they call the modern world. And it operated at extremes, unbound economic prosperity realized as an outcome of unlimited suffering. Within this unipolar, unipolar system, the United States is uniquely emblematic of the terrible assemblage of violence, bodily coercion, spatial expansion, exploitation, and financial accumulation. Capitalism becomes lord of the United States because it was so wildly successful in the cotton trade as compared to any other part of the world precisely because planter slavers commanded unlimited supplies of labor, money, and unparalleled economic, unparalleled political power. This history is, set of, is the set of the bewildering pathology concerning embodied blackness, an abstraction in circulation within the American psyche and the gratuitous acts of violence to which it leads. We would like to process this national illness in humanistic terms, but those standards have never applied to our reality. Rather, in the moments when the question of humanity is brought to the fore again and again, the matter of value, literally leveraged as capital, our incessant call to be considered as valuable is already compromised, haunted, and embedded with a totalizing wish for transactional functionality. Ralph tried to hold Mr. Menefield in reserve. By reserve, I mean to hold out for a repertory potential that resonates even in the absence of proof of presence. To hold in reserve is an act of distancing, of retaining for oneself, which does not in this instance concern itself as an act of care. Because to reserve neither takes responsibility for something it did not bring into fruition, nor does it observe or squelch the unstinting desire to show itself as pain, but rather reserved is a taking asunder, gathering the bits, fragments, shards, and setting them aside as an absolute requisition against our overwhelming visuality. In the arc of modernist abstract painting, that rupture began without our even knowing it. Malevich tripled down on black, black square on a white ground, 1915, the so-called zero degree of painting was thick with blackness hijacking the Picasso, which was already a ripoff, the crackling, splitting black cover-up that is the square, and, of course, the subsumed, handwritten inscription that refused to remain hidden, a racist joke, Negroes battling in a cave at night. Now, when the majority of these black works were made, these black works by blacks were made, I'm not sure any of the aforementioned artists knew this bit of art history since it was not widely reported until 2015. But that's not to say um, among them a vexing affinity, a resonance was not felt. There is a subtle yet direct proposition made by these artists' choice of material and matter to produce and correlate a relation between the black work as an object with a resemblance to black life. The qualitative and relational peculiarities clarify the ways in which they are inventive of subjective forms, which is to say, self-abstracting the black object and black life mutually, the whole array of vibrations, pitches, styles, manners, states, values assembled, sieved into the black work, thick, dense, precarious, dispersed blackness as abstraction. Did you notice the details of some of those works I showed you? not untitled, but undefined, multiple self-portraits, a headstone for someone gone too soon. The modes, means, and methods are the dynamics and choreography of capitalism's subjection upon life, black life itself. Accumulation, repetition, precarity, exhaustion, extraction, and so on. Though it is not that simple. Rather, blackness's very objectness has an attunement to and a tone in its qualities, and its effective tonality that enable the artist to convey and the viewer to effectively feel them both. It is thus necessary to be quite specific about describe, in, in describing the role of experience, how bodily knowledge is presented. The Black Work's objective is towards density and opacity, 
Withdrawal is the choreography of consent, the necessary and acting of a relational independence that merely veils a shift in the qualitative presence of black life to that of a trace. For black life continues in the black work quite literally in the dark, yet it always carries that haint, though obscured, veiled, foreclosed because of how it has come to be in the world as a form. Tactile, these black works possess a physical quality that constitutes their own corporeality, a tangible visceral somatic presence, flesh that has passed into color. The black work is an imaging of the feeling towards a figure, towards the experience of its embodiment virtually. Herein lies the performative expressiveness of blackness, not type, but force of chroma, factor, inscription, scale, texture, slickness, thickness resemblance forsaken for semblance. Such gestic tactility avoids the discursive and figurative language of representation, while nevertheless posing a new sensual ideogram in abstraction that performs duality, a shape shifting between the desire for representation and contouring and deepening the terms for resisting it. Thank you very much.